right, let's get started. So welcome everyone. And many thanks for joining the webinar, Tips and Tricks for Daily Living for Children with a Y. My name is Dagmar Mecking. I'm the host of the session. I'm CEO of Foundation Care for Brittle Bones. Care for Brittle Bones is a foundation with a single goal, which is to improve quality of life um, for OI through research in the very widest sense. This webinar, which is sharing knowledge, is actually a good example of what we do. Let me now hand over to the presenters for today, Kathleen Montpetit and Marie-Hélène Lafrance, both working at the Shriners Hospital for Children. Many thanks, Kathleen and Marie-Hélène, for being with us today. We're very much looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting us to give this presentation. So uh, I'm Kathleen. I've been an OT for over 40 years, and most of the time, most of my career has been here at the Shriners. With 25 plus years working with the OI team, I've been very fortunate to have been part of the um, era when uh, there were wonderful new treatments coming out for OI. Since my retirement in 2014, I work part-time in clinical research, but continue to be involved with the OI community in various projects and research. And Marie-Hélène. So my name is Marie-Hélène. Uh, I'm happy to be here today. I have been an occupational therapist for the past 15 years almost and working here at the Shriners for 12 years with, uh, with the OI uh, population and I'm quite honored to be presenting today with you, Kathy. <laughs> um, this project sort of came about following the success of the Physical Rehabilitation Consortium, a consensus paper that, was, uh, that occurred in 2017. And um, um, sort of working on the, on the momentum and positivity of that, we came up with the idea to do a project just on self-care. Here at the hospital, we had had um, a resource for self-care for many years, and it certainly was time to update it. And with the support of Care for Brittle Bones, we had the idea of uh, not just um, using our, our ideas, but also reaching out to our colleagues in healthcare, as well as the families of kids with OI, to in order to get as many ideas as possible. So basically, this project is um, targeting families and youth with moderate to severe OI, and I'll explain why later. What we want to do is develop a resource of strategies, ideas, devices, and equipment to promote independence and self-care tasks. And how we how we went about doing that was to develop a survey. Uh, for therapists about their experience and that of their families to share their challenges and successes in achieving independence in daily life. Okay, so the next slide. Um, the results of the survey. Uh, first of all, the survey was developed by the three of us, myself, Marie-Hélène, and Lisa Mills from UK. We sent it out to 25 therapists that we, the names we had gathered from various contacts through Care for Little Bones and just, you know, word of mouth. Um, we had nine responses to our survey, which isn't a bad percentage. And what was most exciting was that they were from all over the world, the responses. So then what we did was integrate all their comments into a PowerPoint that we had previously established and used with families and in conferences. And um, these, this is what we're going to share with you today. And of course, the next step also would be that this information and ideas be transformed into a digital and paper resource so that it can, uh, it can be shared even more fully. So of course, when we're talking about activities of daily living, you can move, um, Dagmar. Um, we all know that the basic activities of daily living are feeding, grooming, dressing, toileting, bathing, and very importantly, the transfers that are required to be able to do toileting, bathing, um, and even dressing activities. So those are the main topics that we're going to talk that we're going to comment on today. I think the first point I want to make and, and a point that we've been underlying all these years when we were working with the families is that all the movements required for ADL are in fact exercise. The muscles are strengthened as the limbs move against gravity. There's lots of balance and equilibrium required as you change different positions. You're doing stretches by all the movements of the shoulders, elbows, hips, and knees. So there's no doubt there's lots of exercise happening. 
as well, there are so many benefits to being independent in ADL. Um, it can help reduce fractures because of the exercise that you're doing within the task. It certainly increases self-esteem when children realize they can do these tasks by themselves. It's, it's so encouraging. It allows them to do many things that are private tasks privately, promotes independence, which then further facilitates integration to school. So it's clearly lots of benefits. In general comments, um, mainly from our experience, we can say that children with mild to moderate OI really have minimal issues with independence and self-care. Um, that's not to say though that, that, that there are some children with minimal involvement who do need help, but generally speaking, they can accomplish independence without too much assistance. So we're talking really more about the children who have, you know, more, more a severe involvement, involvement of all limbs, a lot of deformities, quite short stature, and they really do have more challenges to gain independence. On a positive note, I think our experience has shown us that despite all the challenges, given time, they do become independent in ADL. So I think it's important to keep that in the back of your mind. Another point is the whole idea of readiness and motivation. Something we've learned the hard way is that if the families and the children are just not interested and just not ready to tackle the challenges of independence in ADL, maybe there are other things going on in their life, broadings, trying to stand, trying to walk. Sometimes you have to just swallow your pride as an OT and wait until they're ready to do it. And what we have found over time is that often when the children get closer to adolescence or, or you know, later in school time, they realize all the things they're missing out on because they're not independent in ADL. That, that sleepover that they really wanted to go to, peer pressure. Um, so, you know, readiness and motivation is a very important aspect. And another thing that has come up is to really be a little bit cognizant of the culture of the people that we're dealing with because in certain cultures, it is quite appropriate for mom to do everything or a child to be fed, child to be dressed. So you have to sort of work within those parameters as well. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, again, some general tips. Always try to emphasize with the families to start these tasks early. Start with the very simplest of tasks. Try to minim minimize the assistance of others. Basically, I say anything they can do, let them do. Um, Recognize the unique strategies and methods that the children have and that the families have, and certainly uh, optimize, um, um, maximize on those. And of course, adaptations are a really big key thing, and we hope we'll be able to show you some ones that have worked well. As we talked about in the consensus paper, one of the things that uh, that has that has definitely we've seen a correlation is the children who have a lot of upper extremity issues, this certainly does affect independence in ADL. And those upper extremity issues are, are as follows. Bowing the humerus and or short limbs, this really reduces the ability to reach. Some children have radial head dislocation and this directly affects elbow flexion and forearm rotation, which is also super key for um, tasks of um, feeding and grooming. Forearm deformities, bowing of the deform, uh, bowing of the of the forearms can also affect pronation, supination alone, not related to radial head dislocation, and just overall muscle weakness or hypermobility can affect strength, gripping of all kinds of utensils and certain specific tasks. The bowing of the humerus really affects the functional range of motion, and the decreased pronation, supination really touches on the ability to turn the palm towards the face. So just wanted to underline those challenges. All right, so Medialand is gonna move on now and speak about feeding issues. Okay, so in terms of feeding, um, I can move this up. Um, so therapists agree that most children with OI can manage feeding tasks. Um, there are some challenges though, and these include uh, decreased strength or joint hypermobility. 
uh, which impact the grouping of utensil ability and the ability to pour a uh, liquid. Um, and like Kathleen said, like the limited elbow flexion from the radial head dislocation, as we can see often in type 5 OI, uh, may impact the ability to bring a cup or a spoon uh, to the mouth. Also, if a child is unable to sit and is reclined in his wheelchair, uh, bringing the spoon to the mouth can be difficult. And other issue have been identified, um, like the children being slower to eat, so the food gets cold. And also children with dental issue uh, may have chewing limitation because of the malocclusion or to the fact that their teeth are more fragile. Um, moving to the next slide, in terms of feeding solution, uh, many were identified, such as the build-up handles that are easier to grip, uh, the curved knives to cut the food more easily, the angle or longer utensil to reach the mouth. A straw can be used also to decrease the need to bring the, um, the cup to the mouth every time. Uh, obviously, lighter items are easier to lift and to manipulate. Uh, we want to make sure to provide good support in the sitting position. And we also notice how, um, it, how impressive it is um, that, that the child, the family, uh, with their therapist, but on their own also develop their individual, individual sorry, strategies uh, based on their unique needs, uh, personality, and uh, creativity. We have here a picture of um, a little boy who have developed his own, uh, his own strategy because he has a severe limitation of uh, elbow flexion. So by using his two hands, he's able to uh, drink uh, on his own. Um, in terms of grooming, uh, challenges in participation in grooming uh, tasks uh, include the inability to access the sink uh, because the children are too short or the wheelchair cannot fit in the bathroom when living in smaller apartments. Um, difficulty reaching the back or top of head due to short arm, bowing or limited strength, uh, which makes it also difficult to style the hair. And applying makeup, washing the face, shaving can also be uh, challenging because of the limited grip strength or the lack of endurance to maintain the arm in uh, elevated position. And also the opening, squeezing of containers, such as um, a toothpaste can be uh, difficult. Next slide. Uh, in terms of grooming solution, uh, access to the sink is the number one key. Uh, the cupboard uh, below the sink can be removed so that the wheelchair can come closer uh, to the sink, to the counter. Uh, a step stool can be used for the ones that can climb up. Um, counter can be made lower to accommodate a short stature. So the one in the picture on the right was made by a parent uh, using some old furniture. So it doesn't have to be uh, fancy and complicated. Um, next slide. Okay. Other proposed solutions to facilitate the participation in grooming tasks include long and dull devices, a stand for hair dryer, uh, washing hand tray, washing hair washing, <laughs> it's right, <laughs> sorry, long lever, taps, and, and there are many other accessories such as a, a toothpaste squeezer to facilitate squeezing of the, uh, of the um, toothpaste and the use of an electric toothbrush as well. Um, next slide. So dressing. Therapists agree that children are usually successful at getting dressed and undressed, but it takes them longer to learn and require more training. So they should start at a young age. Um, we can ask them to remove simple items uh, to start with. Uh, teach undressing first is usually easier. Um, we can use loose and stretchy clothing such as jogging suit, pajamas, uh, encourage the practice at an appropriate time, so maybe during the weekend, the bath time, and not necessarily uh, in the morning with the routine where uh, everybody's in a rush uh, to get to school, to work, uh, or daycare. Um, a clothing adaptation might be necessary sometimes to ease the dressing, such as using Velcro. Um, make sure that there's adequate space and support for the child to be able to participate safely and comfortably. And the timing uh, of when to start practicing this task really depends on the physical readiness of the child. And as Kathleen said, the overall, the overall readiness of the, of the family to, uh, to start participating in, uh, those, uh, in those tasks. And um, a great tip uh, being to break down the task into the smallest steps uh, possible. Next slide. In terms of upper body dressing, 
Uh, it is noticed that a significant challenge is the size of the head, making it difficult to put on and take off the shirt. Um, also, the humerus uh, deformity can make it harder to move the arm through the sleeves. Um, and we can see that uh, buttons are often easier to do and undo compared to uh, engaging zippers and doing snaps. But overall, upper body dressing is easier than uh, lower body. Uh, there are several solutions to increase the participation in dressing, uh, and these include like compensatory movement that the child makes to succeed uh, in the task. Uh, front opening shirt uh, also can sometimes be easier than a, a t-shirt that you have to pull uh, to put over your head. Um, but when you do use t-shirt, uh, the large neck opening or stretchy material makes it easier to pull over the head. And again, like the use of Velcro or magnet button, a uh, larger buttonhole makes it easier to do uh, the fastener compared to the regular small buttons. Um, overall, lower body is more difficult, uh, lower body dressing. And um, the frequent fracture also reduces uh, their, their strength, so it makes it even harder to do, uh, to do this task. Um, reaching the feet and pulling up the pants and socks can be difficult due to their short arm. But again, the laxity can, mainly the laxity at the hip, uh, can be beneficial to compensate for the, for the short arm, um, where we can see uh, in the picture, the little boy can bring uh, his pants, uh, his feet close to, the, close to his hand. Um, and lying down, in lying down, like in this, in this picture, makes it easier. Often in it, it's the favorite uh, position uh, for them to, uh, to participate in lower body dressing over standing. Uh, there's other solution. Uh, like, again, wearing stretchy clothes or stretchy pants. Um, for the shoes, uh, having fixed uh, laces uh, can allow slip on. Um, and the use of reaching devices can make it easier for the socks and to get feet through the, the pants. And also, like, changing clothing style, maybe for girls to, use, to wear a skirt, um, may be easier uh, to put on and take off uh, compared to pants. Okay, move on to the Okay, my <laughs> turn again. <laughs> okay, some uh, comments about, general comments about toileting, toileting and OI. So I think we, all of us have been working for several years in this area, know that this is probably the single most difficult task for children with severe OI. And it's, uh, it continues to be challenging after all these years, trying to find solutions. Um, Lots of uh, comments and ideas about this from the surveys, but we're still looking for some more solutions. <laughs> um, so basically, I want to say that there's two things to think about before getting started. Is the child ready to embark on independence and toileting? And I'm thinking about two physical uh, points. One is does a child have sphincter control? Does he know how to how to use the sphincter for for, for uh, elimination? And second, can he sit independently? Because I think those two things are a real basic requirement before starting toilet training. And then as well, does he have the communication skills to say, I need to go to the bathroom? Those are in, in place. Then you've got the, the pre uh, the preliminary things ready. The other thing about toileting to realize is that there's really three basic elements. Being able to get on and off some sort of toilet device, being able to manage the clothing, and then being able to do the hygiene, the wiping. Challenges. Clothing can be very complicated to take on and off. Wiping is always noted as a difficult element because of the short arms. Managing menstruation issues can also be uh, another challenge. And even flushing and reaching the toilet paper. These were all identified in the survey as challenges that kids with OI face. A um, couple of other comments. The children have to have adequate support to be able to free their hands. And the other thing that we have noted over the years is that children who have had a spinal fusion, this can really quite affect the fragility of the, the flexibility of the shrine. And they may need extra support for developing a new, because they have to use a new movement. So 
just a few more challenges to deal with. So talking about some solutions, um, I think the hygiene solutions are the most difficult ones. And I think we have to admit we don't have any perfect answer for this. In a perfect world, the children with short ar arms and, and severe deformities, everybody would have a toilet with a rinse and dry function that they could just press buttons and that would be that. Um, otherwise, there are these toilet aids available that are somewhat long handled, somewhat curved, that holds the toilet paper and with this extension you can reach the area. Patients have told us, kids have told us, they don't work that well. Sometimes it's too hard to put the paper in, too hard to release the paper out. They don't, they don't feel comfortable using them. Again, that's also sometimes a readiness issue. Um, the, I have found on, um, on one of the websites a device put out by a little, uh, uh, not put out by, but a device used by uh, Little People of America. That's the item on the bottom left. It's called a Freedom One. What's nice about it is it does come with a travel pack, a travel case. Um, some of the other solutions that we've heard from people is the use of urinals, male urinals, obviously, but there are also female urinals available. And we do have one little, um, one little girl who is practicing with a female urinal called the Shiwi, which is very inexpensive and available on Amazon. And then other people have even suggested that when, when all else fails, try wiping from the front. Not the ideal solution, but sometimes these have to be considered. Um, now, if we try to tackle the problem of transferring, there's really um, a couple of issues to consider. The solution depends on the environment that the children are in and on their mode of mobility. So sometimes the wheel, if the child is in a wheelchair, it's not able to be used in the home. Sometimes they do use the wheelchair in the home, but the bathroom is inaccessible. Sometimes the toilet is too low for a person using a wheelchair. Sometimes if there's a handicapped toilet available, it's too high for the person with a short stature. There's all the issues of safety that have to be considered. And then there's the problem of people being a little bit small and the toilet seat opening being too large. And then I had another case where they reduced the aperture for the toilet seat and it was nice and snug and the child didn't feel they were falling through, but they couldn't get their hand in to do the wiping. So challenges for sure. Um, in terms of solutions, uh, one of the ways that might help to think about the solutions is think about what is the child's method of mobility. So let's talk first about if a child is due, is, is somebody who has floor mobility or the shuffling movement. So then you might want to consider a child potty uh, that's well secured so that it would be safe. And, you know, this would be something that hopefully the child would be able to transfer independently and give the child that independence. And you can, you can get some, um, they are available commercially, and then you can adapt them to make them safer. So those are some ideas for children who actually do floor mobility in their home. Now, if the child is using the wheelchair, we'll just go to the next slide. Um, some things to consider would be to use a raised toilet seat if you need to raise the height to accommodate the height of the wheelchair. If there's a problem of accessibility, you might want to consider a over the toilet commode and that could be um, used in a bedroom or in another room. And I have seen it used in conjunction with a bed. So the child just shuffles from the bed over to the commode. Um, so that's one, that one idea. A uh, transfer board from the wheelchair to the toilet is another idea. Um, one of the survey responses was giving a nice example of having a platform, a custom platform built right beside the toilet that the, per that the child or adult could transfer to and it was large enough that they could even manage the clothing removal. I had one of my uh, patients who got the idea of transferring directly front on onto the toilet and not bothering to turn around. She would face the back and that worked well for her. 
So uh, the next slide shows a few more um, ideas uh, of different grab bars, different step stools, uh, supports that can go on the toilet if the child needs to uh, be able to use their hands, freestanding toilet paper hold, holders, um, just a few, few different ideas. And again, it all depends on the environment and what is the type of mobility. For example, up here on the upper right, um, that would be a good setup for somebody who's, who's ambulatory and can, and can walk and transfer themselves onto the toilet. But you see that the bars are in place and the steps are in place for that. So next slide. You just wanted to highlight too a couple of the really cool ideas that came out on the on the surveys. Here was one from somebody I can't remember where, but you might recognize yourself if you're in the if you're listening to the webinar. Um, we've had some people get a two-in-one toilet seat, basically a child and adult aperture, which was fitted to their loo. Okay, so this person's got to be from the UK. <laughs> then all they need to do is flip one up to have the other size available for others. And I mentioned this before, this was another unique idea where um, the therapist told us about being asked by an older young adult woman with OI to mentor young female child with OI with the parent's consent, of course. They FaceTime so that the young adult talks with the child through the transfer toilet to wheelchair with mom assisting as needed. And they've done other FaceTime tutorials for transfers to bed and clothing management. I think this is just a fantastic idea that we should be using more about uh, fostering mentoring among, among our patients. Um, the next slide just uh, gives, it shows a few more ideas of uh, how to handle the toilet transfer if you're walking, um, the use of steps, the use of a small pediatric toilet or what we call daycare model toilet benches, and of course bars for, um, bars for support. I'll just mention about um, the benches. A couple of comments from the survey did mention the importance of benches being custom made even to really be close into the toilet. It uh, fosters safety and independence. And I think the next slide, yeah, gives a good, a good idea of that. The two ideas on the bottom were uh, equipment made by families. Um, top right shows a little girl who is practicing uh, for the first time, she had always been transferred onto the toilet by her parents, and as she was able to increase her mobility skills, we were able to show her how she could do the transfer herself with appropriate bars. And the picture on the left shows how a young, a young boy found his own way of being safe doing his clothing removal by balancing himself with his head against the wall. So, just uh, another idea. And the next slide, um, Again, uh, something that was shared on the surveys. Uh, I don't have a picture of the exact example, but the picture does show a custom uh, transfer board that was made by one of our patients, allowing um, this little girl to transfer completely independently onto her toilet. But the idea being that something looks like a table which fits over the toilet area and beside the toilet, with a cutaway for the toilet, and the person shuffled out of their chair, adjusted their clothing, moved over to the aperture, and there was room to reach for cleansing, and they managed the clothes and shuffled back to their chair. So probably as the severity of OI increases, the need for custom adaptation also increases. Um, just a few words about bathing because we want to uh, we want to move on to transfers as well. Lots of challenges regarding bathing, getting into the tub. Lots of bathtubs have very narrow rims, making the placement of transfer boards difficult. There's always the challenge of getting per, getting yourself down into the tub. If you have a large bath aid, that's great. And maybe you can do that independently, but then the rest of the family can't get into the bathtub because it's difficult to remove. Always issues of safety comments about reaching the soap, comments about needing support in, in the tub itself to be able to use your hands to do the bathing. So here are some of the solutions. Um, steps outside of the bathtub for one. Uh, bath board, as I mentioned, or, tr or transfer boards placed over the tub if you've got decent rims. 
uh, non-slip coverings everywhere, adjustable telephone shower. And I kind of really like the idea on the top right. This is basically a uh, Tupperware bin or plastic bin that the mom had loaded up with old magazines and it became very sturdy and stable and it served as the bench in the bathtub. That was a terrific idea. And the next slide just shows a few more uh, options. You have the uh, bath chair that has the extension over the tub side, so the child was able to do the transfer directly from the wheelchair. Uh, the, and the bottom picture shows the lift and another little basic thing. So I'm going to just hand over to Mary Elaine. We wanted to talk now about transfers. It's really to toilet and tub. And the ability to transfer is so key to ADL skills. So we wanted to really put a little focus on this before we wrap up. Okay, so um, like Kathleen was saying, like um, the way you're doing your transfer really depends on the environment that you're in and your mode of mobility. So other than uh, transferring to the toilet and to the, um, the tub, uh, there are many other transfers that the child will be asked to do and will have to learn to do. Um, so we start uh, with uh, moving to the same level uh, with lots of space, no gap, like for them to practice. And you may want to use a transfer board initially, like to be able to close the gap and allow them to slide from one, one surface to uh, the other. And then as their arm gets uh, stronger, their arms and legs get stronger, uh, they can move to uneven heights, uh, smaller surfaces, they can manage the gap uh, without needing the use of a, of a transfer board. Um, but these uh, definitely requires a lot of time and a lot of practice. Um, Just comment on me. On the, oops, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so yeah, so depending on um, your, like Kathleen was saying, the, the environment, like your, your bed might be too high or the mattress might be too soft. Uh, making the the transfer a bit more a bit more difficult. Um, so solutions uh, for this matter would be to have the mattress directly on the floor to reduce the the height, um, and have a firmer uh, mattress to ease uh, the transfer as well. Uh, for the bed, uh, the a height adjustable bed might be uh, interesting as well if you uh, mobilize with your wheelchair. Um, what else, what else, what else? If you're mobilizing from the floor, uh, you can use a uh, step, step foam. So we see one with <laughs> the little doggy uh, here. So um, that, that was a, a family that bought this, uh, which should have been used with a dog, but they were using it as well <laughs> for their uh, child to be able to climb up onto the sofa and the different surfaces uh, to access the sink uh, as well. And uh, other uh, children, uh, like the one uh, at the bottom, uh, use the, the, the foot plate of his wheelchair to pivot uh, when, the, um, when the surface was at the same level at, as his wheelchair. He found that uh, easier to, to transfer from the front than uh, sliding to the side. So, uh, we, um, and we'll see in the following slide also um, that the foot plate of the wheelchair uh, can be very useful. So the first, uh, the first video on the left is um, a little boy practicing uh, <laughs> going up a uh, different height. So you see that the difference in the height uh, in this video is very, very minimal. So we, we started practicing practicing with this little uh, height difference. And then we, uh, we added another mat on top uh, for him to be able to uh, mobilize like on the floor at home and get in and out of his bed, uh, which is bed being a mattress directly on the floor. And in the second video, so we have our little boy here who, uh, mobilizes at home mainly on the floor and he uh, on this video was learning how to uh, get on to his wheelchair independently so we see um all the steps required to achieve this uh, to achieve this transfer and the use of the foot plate uh, for him to be able to climb the strength required on his legs and on his arms to be able to do this transfer and the use of his head also 
um, to balance and to to help him uh, get get on. Oh yeah, so we've used the uh, initially we've used this cushion on the floor just to make the height uh, lower, like the um, easy, easier, like to to get onto onto the foot plate, um, and then on the seat of this wheelchair and he's quite <laughs> proud <laughs> to have succeeded. So a lot of effort, a lot of practice for them to become successful at uh, transferring. Okay, so I'm handing it to Kathleen again. Um, okay, so I just wanted to share also a couple of really nice ideas that came out of the, um, out of the survey. One was s suggesting to our, to our patients and our clients that carry ordinary items in the backpack, such as a decent length pin, pen or a slim umbrella to have just a few extra inches to press buttons in elevators and road crossings. Such a simple idea, but so good. Uh, looking for usable things in ordinary shops like small size furniture. I have personally found that the um, adaptive products on the Little People of America website, they have excellent ideas and uh, ideas on equipment and ideas on where to get equipment. So wanted to share those with you as well. Um, so our take home message is that daily living is exercise. So maybe that's how you can sell it to your, <laughs> to your families and children, that uh, it's not a waste of time. You're doing exercise at the same time. Readiness, motivation, timing is everything. And uh, I'm sure you all are aware of that and will take it into account. What they can do, let them do. And that's sort of a mantra that we give to the families that we make sure the families understand. And if we see them doing, thing for, doing things for the kids that they can actually do themselves, we give them a big... And then I always say, use it so that you don't lose it later in life. And then we will also like to tell you about what we have in mind coming up. So because of the terrific ideas and the nice response we got from the survey, our vision is that somehow we build a kind of a library of all of these ideas that people could go in and take out some ideas, go in and look around at the different ideas, just like you look around at books in, in a library, and see if any of those ideas will work for some of your patients. We'd also like people to put ideas in and then anybody could borrow them. So hopefully we'll be able to figure all that out in a digital way with the help of Care for Brittle Bones. And also in doing this uh, webinar made us realize that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, basic, we talked about really the basic activities of ADL. But we have to also remember that come teen and young adult years, the instrumental activities of daily living, cooking, shopping, banking, public transportation, are very important. And um, another great project would be to maybe do a similar survey, maybe focusing a lot on young adults, trying to get their input and their ideas. How are they managing in their apartments? in their uh, residences at university and, and, and how they manage their lives um, as they're starting to leave home. So uh, hopefully we can replicate this project for that subject, that topic. And again, another thing that came up as we were talking to parents and families and children was another field that we all need to learn more about is what is it like to be a person with a Y who is now in the um, stage of being a parent themselves. And again, lots of mentoring, lots of sharing of ideas. So we hope that, that we'll be able to maybe develop this project as we, as we move on. Um, want to make sure that we recognize the contributions from all the people who responded to the survey and they're listed here. Also, we'd like to thank uh, all the families who gave permission to have their pictures used, to have their ideas used. Um, we're very grateful for that, and they really are a wealth of um, information, and, and uh, they really are the brains behind uh, all of the ideas, let's face it. So I think that pretty well wraps it up for us. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Dagmar, so that you can uh, handle the question and answers. Excellent.
Thank you very much. Um, I see that two questions have come in already, and I would like to encourage you to uh, send in more. If you can see the Q&A button on your webinar screen, we still have a little bit of time. Um, question number one I have seen is, um, is from your uh, experience, uh, what is really the area that you see people struggling most with? You know, like really the area where people um, have, have most difficulty and usually do need help so that people can anticipate on those problems. I'm going to speak for myself. I would say, hands down, toileting. Oh, yeah. Getting on and off the toilet and managing the hygiene and the clothes. That those three parts of toileting has got to be the most difficult. Um, to start early on that, I think the biggest thing that we keep pushing from the time the kids are so little is bottom scooting, shuffling. Because I always say, if the child can move along their bottom, they can transfer anywhere. We can adapt, we can adapt anything so that they can use that skill. Yeah, I agree. Totally. <laughs> Very clear. And the second question is, um, how do you actually organize this area or support this area in Montreal? Uh, how do you build it into your support to families with OI? Do you... Uh, give that uh, support routinely to everyone or as needed? How, how does that work? Oh, that's a complex answer. I think um, because our patient comes from Montreal, but they do come from all over the America, <laughs> basically all over the world, but mainly all over America. So, um, so for some children living in the city of Montreal or around the city of Montreal, it's easy for them like to come often and to and to practice these skills uh, with us uh, it, whereas during their ot and pt yeah, session yeah whereas people coming from far coming in montreal for like once a year or twice a year for consult like seeing the the doctor getting their treatment and um, so we do a consult we practice we provide recommendation but we cannot practice as much so we hand it over to the local therapist when there is a local therapist. So. And, the, and the family. Yeah, yeah and the definitely. family. When, when, there's, when therapists are not active or, you know, not accessible, we try to give them, you know, we, we have had over the years a small booklet and we would provide that booklet with a lot of these ideas in the booklet. And this is what we want to improve and enhance yeah. going forward. This is about the conference Quality of Life for OI, um, a conference that will be organized in November this year in Amsterdam and will very much cover uh, topics of interest for this community that is interested in this webinar. Registration will hopefully still start in February, otherwise early March. Um, it's directed to clinicians, researchers, allied healthcare professionals, as well as the OI community. And uh, hopefully we really get the best of the best of this big uh, network space that you see on the top of this slide. So the European Reference Networks, um, the uh, Brittle Bones Disease Consortium on the outside um, of this slide, and then also the uh, OIF and the OIF as the big uh, patient umbrella organizations taking care of uh, the OI community and care for Brittle Bones is a little bit the glue in between. We're, we're working together very well for this conference. And what you can expect there is a four-day program uh, with um, very much the focus on the topics you see here. So multidisciplinary team, standard of good clinical care and good research for OI, outcome measures, the partnership required between orthopedics and rehabilitation, um, psychosocial aspects of OI, uh, often not uh, seen and discussed enough. We'll definitely have uh, five, five hours of a workshop for that. There will be plenty of networking opportunities for knowledge sharing, abstract poster sessions, and importantly, celebrating and improving quality of life together with people with OI, because there will be a substantial number of people with OI discussing with us. Um, you can expect uh, many key speakers from around the world. I do believe uh, there will also be um, a space from lots of people from Montreal, for sure. Uh, so we have Mary Elaine and Kathleen both participating. Um, and uh, Lena Landevec, who is also on the call, she will be there. Claire Hill, also I think on the call, will also be there. So be sure to be there too. And uh, hopefully, 
um, we all can build the knowledge together um, in support of <clears throat> quality of life for people with OI. If you want to hear the uh, recording of this webinar, or if you want to see the slides later on, use that for your own practices. You can do that with the help of this link where you can sign up on uh, the newsletter that will uh, give you a link to the recording as soon as it's before. All right, so this basically closes the webinar uh, for today. I would like to very much thank Kathleen and uh, Mary Elaine for their wonderful examples and contributions. And this has been so much work getting the <laughs> approval from everyone on those pictures. Uh, that's very important from a data privacy point of view, but also you, you said you enjoyed getting back in touch with those families and that's exactly why you're doing such a great job for the OI community. So uh, thank you both. Thank you everyone on the call and hopefully we'll uh, come together in the next webinar soon. Bye-bye.